Hello and welcome. In this video, I'll talk about nuclear weapons, the design, the physics, and the inner workings. Now, all these informations are available on the internet in the literature, so there's no need to call the FBI. Also, if you're watching this, you probably know the basics of nuclear physics and nuclear weapons, so I won't go over this this time. So let's get started with the simplest design and little boy, or the cannon type. Little Boy was a uranium bomb of roughly 60 pounds of uranium-235, much of which was 89% enriched with some uranium at only 50% of uranium-235. Two halves of the metal, called subcritical, were separated inside a long pipe, one coated with beryllium, the other one with a polonium source. Codenamed Abner, this design was cheap but easy to construct and therefore very effective, although it had a low yield and worked well with uranium-235. The whole thing was about 3 meters long, 71 centimeters wide, and tipping the scale about 4.5 ton. Triggered by cordite, which is a compound made of nitroglycerin, nitrocellulose, and some petroleum jelly. The projectile was a 3.4 kilograms of a hollow cylinder fired at a piston-like block of 30 kilogram from the opposite side of the so-called gun type design, and not the other way around. The receiving end was surrounded by a tungsten carbide compound at the bottom called a temper. More on that later. Upon firing the cordite, the hollowed cylinder would travel down a barrel pushed by the shock wave. When two subcritical mass of fissile material are suddenly brought together, they become critical or supercritical. This configuration allows neutron generated from fission to trigger two or three fission themselves. Therefore, an exponential chain reaction takes place. Upon meeting the target, the polonium slash beryllium source would activate and start releasing neutrons. There's always a stray neutron flying around all around us at, at all times. But in nuclear weapons, these stray neutrons cannot be relied upon enough to trigger the chain reaction. At the exact moment needed, a very precise timing is extremely critical. Therefore, a separate source of neutron is necessary. Each fission takes only about 10 billionths of a second to complete. So if only 2 pounds of 0.91 kilogram of uranium undergo complete fission, then the whole process will take about 0.8 millionth of a second. To put this into perspective, let's say 1 second is a whole day. Let's stretch 1 second to 86,400 seconds or 24 hours. Pushing the detonator at T equals zero or midnight, the first fission happens after the shock wave pushes the piston down the barrel, which in our scale takes about 22 seconds. That's a long time. Another millisecond and the first fission starts. Now even at that scale, one millisecond is a really short time and it's impossible to see. Now assuming that there is two neutron release per fission, the whole 910 grams of uranium-235 will undergo fission within 77 milliseconds. That's an incredibly short time and it happened like that. The uranium is now a ball of plasma at a billion degrees. It's a super of electron, highly excited neutrons and nucleus. Tons of gamma x-rays and an impossible pressure above a million atmosphere. Nothing on Earth can contain this. This ball of superheated plasma is pushing the bomb material outward and the fireball typical of a nuclear explosion becomes visible. Now, little boy only had a small year, about 15,000 tons of TNT, which is, by nuclear weapon standard, pretty much just a, a little boy. Remember, there was 60 kilograms of uranium in there, about 140 some pounds. Most of it did not fission. So this is a cheap, dirty, an inefficient design. It can easily be put together by anyone who knows a little bit about nuclear physics. Therefore, it is a concern for terrorism. The next design was the Fat Man design, which is an implosion type bomb utilizing plutonium-239. Now, plutonium-239 cannot be used in a gun barrel type bomb because its high rate of fission would make it fizzle before it's time to detonate, and we don't want that. Instead, the engineer Los Alamos, New Mexico in the 1940s came up with the implosion design, which compressed and increased the density of the material undergoing fission. Now, this reduces the path of neutrons between each atoms, which brings the subcritical mass 
into a critical mass by being smaller and denser in order to achieve supercriticality, which is what we want in the nuclear bomb. The whole system relies on the exact timing of the detonation of all 32 detonators surrounding the plutonium sphere called the pit, which is an alloy of plutonium and gallium. Plutonium is a very hard metal, difficult to work with, so gallium is added to it to improve the metallurgy and stabilize the crystal that are being formed when plutonium is cooling down. Also, it has a low neutron cross section. When the shockwave traveled through the explosives, it radiate outward in a spherical shape, spreading away from the center, which is the detonator. Now, in order to make the shockwave go spherical and compress the plutonium pit, to achieve a compression implosion type shockwave, we must shape these waves into a shrinking wave. This is done by using two types of explosives, one in which the shockwave travel fast, like RDX and TNT, relative to the second one, in which the wave is slowed down, like TNT and barium nitrate, called baritol. At the same time, the shockwave converge onto the pit. A neutron source is triggered. This was a 50 Curie polonium source in the form of a pellet on the inside of a hollow core. It was grooved on its side, coated with nickel and gold, with beryllium. So when it when the pit crushes it, it releases all the neutrons. This type of neutron triggering is now obsolete and replaced by a zipper, which is an electrical device on the outside of the bond. Mostly deuterium and tritium gas inside a vacuum chamber, accelerated by a high voltage, creating neutrons, bombarding the whole mechanism, the whole bomb, the whole thing. Also, the zipper being on the outside of the bomb allows for the empty space inside the nuclear pit to be free so other things can be put inside, like more deuterium and tritium to increase the power and the yield of the bomb. By releasing neutrons through fusion upon compression and heating. If you do that, if you add deuterium and tritium inside a hollow pit of plutonium, you have what we call a boosted bomb. Boosted because it increased the neutron yield, therefore increasing the number of fission undergoing at the last minute upon detonation. And the, the pit itself is sometimes surrounded by another heavy and dense metal shell called a tamper. It's sometimes made of uranium-238 or gold or tungsten or lead. Most of the time uranium-238 though, because it can increase the number of fission undergoing with fast neutrons coming out of the core when it starts fissioning. Now this tamper reflects the neutron trying to escape from the fissioning core. Now the addition of deuterium and tritium inside a pit and surrounding it with a tamper greatly increased the power and the yield of the bomb. Most nuclear weapons today are fission bomb. Most of the time with a tamper, sometimes boosted, sometimes not. It depends how much yield we want out of the thing. In the first few nanoseconds of the explosion, the X-ray and gamma radiation is so intense, in fact, that it acts as a powerful pushing force against anything standing in its way. This property was thought of in the early months of 1951 by physicist Stan Ullum, who proposed his idea to Edward Taylor. Together they came up with the idea of a super, which is commonly known as a hydrogen or H-bomb. The fusion process helps complete and add into the overall yield of the weapon, but is never the main source of energy when the super goes off. Instead, several stages of fission, fusion, fission, and so on can be stacked up to achieve enormous yield. One such example happened on October 30th, 1961, when the Soviet detonated a 50 megaton bomb over the deserted island in the Arctic Circle. There is no theoretical limit to the power of these weapons, but because of the expanding superheated gas at the beginning of the detonation, it is, well, a sphere. Most of the energy is radiated outward, so a lot of destructive power is lost to the surrounding and up in the space. So it is pointless, expensive and wasteful to build and set off weapons of destructive yield over a few megatons. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this video and learned a thing or two. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask, drop a comment, like and maybe subscribe. Thank you for watching.